Hey guys, so I'm over in Michigan driving around today. I uh, had a number of meetings in Lower Michigan. Uh, some of my clients over here, and, and one thing that we've been talking about, uh, especially it's an issue with larger dairies or, or dairies that are, um, you know, not land heavy. So we have a lot of farms that are, you know, running maybe an acre a cow or acre and a half a cow, something like that. And so we're trying to... Um, make these nutrient management plans work and it's a it's a struggle um and one of the the things that it's important to think of when we're when we're thinking about these dairies and we're, we're sizing them um and thinking about what kind of land base we need and stuff is just you know what are the nutrients that come onto the farm and what are the nutrients that exit the farm and so much in the midwest the, the limiting factor on on uh, manure applications and nutrient management is phosphorus. Uh, that's uh, maybe changing where nitrogen is becoming a, a, a bigger issue. Um, but phosphorus is, is still the, the number one limiting factor on manure applications in, in most of uh, the upper Midwest, uh, some of the Northeast and, and other areas. Um, and if you look at the nutrient content of meat and milk and how much phosphorus is in it, so that is all the phosphorus that we're actually exporting off the farm, unless we're selling feed. Um, the only nutrients that actually leave the farm or, or your controlled acres are the stuff that goes either on the truck um, through, um, through cattle sales or that goes through the milk truck every day. Everything else is supposed to stay there. Now we know some nutrients migrate through, um, <laughs> through erosion and other things. Those are the things that we don't wanna see or we don't wanna talk about. But if you look at those nutrients, they only add up to about 20% of the ration on a farm. And so if you're going to stay phosphorus neutral on your farm, you can need to provide 80% of the ration has to come from homegrown feed. It doesn't have to be homegrown forages, but it has to be homegrown feed. And, and so, I mean, it doesn't have to be an 80% forage diet, but it sure helps to make those things work if that forage level is higher. And so, you know, the issue with byproducts is not that they don't feed well. They, some byproducts are excellent feed. You know, soy hulls, beet pulp, uh, gluten to some extent, you know, mm -hmm. uh, cotton seed, um, you know, those kind of things. Um, but those are, you know, those are the things that can work in a diet. But every time we use one of them... <laughs> We have to think about long term, can we stay phosphorus neutral by using them? And that's a totally, you know, it's a secondary question uh, that we need to answer besides whether it makes sense in a diet. Um, it's does it work uh, in a nutrient management plan? Because it doesn't, you know, maybe short term um, or there's times to use them, but long term as a systems approach, unless you have you know, crops that you're selling off the farm, it's really hard to bring more stuff onto it and remain neutral on, on the phosphorus level. So it's just something to think about. Uh, that 20% rule is about all you can do unless you have a lot of nutrients migrating through water and erosion um, and, and maintain that. So I like I think what we need to do, if if that's a goal of ours, is to be neutral on our, our nutrients, um, is we need to be looking at forages that mimic those byproducts makeup. And, and the things that they they bring, I mean, of course, there's protein in, in some things like distillers or, or uh, soybean meal, but... Um, but the thing that most guys are using them for is digestible fiber sources. Soy hulls, mm -hmm. gluten, beet pulp, citrus pulp, um, those kind of things. And those are things that we can grow on our farms, especially um, 
you know, cool season grasses, warm season grasses, uh, small grains. Those are all things that we can we can grow those kind of nutrients on our farm to replace those byproducts. I'm not saying they're always cost less per pound than byproducts. A lot of times they cost more, depending if you put all your cost into them. But the fact is, if we're going to continue to milk cows and and and, uh, and do it long term, the nutrient management thing is a st- something that we have to price in, and so that's. That's something that I don't think we've been doing maybe a really good job of. And it, and uh, and we're kind of kicking that ball down the road. But at some point, it's going to catch up to us, whether it's next year or 10 years from now. And so my approach to byproducts is to try to build a forage system that doesn't count on them as a forage um, substitute. So I want to build a ration with inclusion rates built in that don't include byproducts we, you know if we need shell corn a little shell corn from some starch or we need some soybean meal or, or roasted beans or whatever for a protein source or whatever but you know we're trying to keep that number as low as possible on that imported f- uh, number and then when we get in a pinch when the year when nothing works right when things aren't right the the quality is is wrong whatever it is well, then we can bring them in, but I'd, I'd prefer to use them as band-aids versus a staple. And I see that being an issue on on some dairies where, you know, we've looked at, at the price of byproducts and we said, hey, we can buy those for less than we can buy forage. And that's true in some instances, but it is a short-term play and we can't do that long-term. So just my thoughts for the day as I'm driving around and I thought, uh, if you have a uh, you know a comment or you want something you want to add you know add it in the comments i'm i'm looking for input on it but uh i i, I think it's something we should be thinking about so talk later guys